Well, I've got a children's talk. I won't call you guys to the front because otherwise we're going to have children running from all different directions and five minutes later they'll still be flowing in. Um, but children, we're thinking, about, we're thinking about being faithful. We're thinking about obeying God. Now, in the Bible, we're told that if we follow God faithfully, if we walk in His Word, that that he will bless us, gets written all over the scriptures everywhere. And that, that can be hard for us to get our head around. We're going to be thinking about that today. But the way that you can think about it is a little bit like with your parents. When, when you're really, really naughty, do things go good for you? No, it doesn't, does it? Generally speaking, there's some form of discipline. There's a punishment that comes. You get in trouble. Mum and dad get grumpy. You know, nice things get taken away, and you were going to get an ice block, but now you don't get an ice block, and all sorts of different stuff happens because you've been naughty. However, if you're obedient, if you listen to mummy and daddy well, and if you eat all your veggies, and if you make sure you tidy your room nicely, and all the different things mum and dad ask you to do, what happens? They're, they're, ni- they're nice to you, aren't they? And they, and they give you good things, and they, they love to reward you, and they tell you you've done a great job, and, and they love to be there with you. And they don't need to discipline you. They don't need to do things to you. And that's a little bit what it's like in the Bible between us and God. You see, you are your parents' children no matter what you do. That's not going to change. But they correct you because they love you. And that's the way it works with us and God. You see, God loves us so much that he doesn't just let us run around and be naughty but he comes along and disciplines us because he wants us to live in a way that makes him really happy and glad. And you and I should be doing the same thing. So that's really hard. As we all know, even the parents in the room know, it's really hard to be good and follow what our parents tell us to do. And so let's pray and ask God to help us do that. Father in heaven, we thank you that you love us. Lord, we pray that you'd help us to listen to you, help us to obey your word but help us also to obey our parents. We recognize as children that you've given us mums and dads to tell us what to do and to care for us, and so we ask that you'd help us to listen to them. Lord, we pray for our children. We thank you for them. We ask that you would encourage their wee little hearts and that you would continue to draw faith out of them, that you would cause faith to rise up and that they might come to confess their hope in Christ the very hope which their baptisms point towards. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to be turning through to the book of Malachi, through to the book of Malachi again. It's our last day in Malachi. If you're a visitor here today, we've been working our way through the book of Malachi before I go on leave. If you don't know where that is, just go to Matthew and go backwards one book. And we're in Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3, and we're going to be reading from verse 6, verse 6 through to 15. This is God's holy and infallible word for you today. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. From the days of your fathers, you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? Will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In your tithes and contributions, you are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not Open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. 
I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil and your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. Then all nations will call you blessed for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. Your words have been hard against me, says the Lord. But you say, how have we spoken against you? You have said, it is vain to serve the Lord. But you say, sorry, it is vain to serve the Lord. What is the profit of our keeping his charge or of walking in mourning before the Lord of hosts? And now we call the arrogant blessed. Evildoers not only prosper, but they put God to the test and they escape. Amen. And so far the reading of God's word. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you have spoken once through the Lord Jesus Christ and revealed yourself perfectly and yet have not left us without a witness, without a testimony. And so we pray that this morning as we, as we open up your word, we ask that you would speak to us freshly again. Lord, we, we know, we know that the word of man will do us no good. We know that opinions and thoughts and and sentiments will bear no fruit in our hearts or lives. And so we ask that today you would speak to us by your Holy Spirit. That, Lord, we might be built up. We might be encouraged. We might be lifted up to look beyond these places and with open ears hear what you have to say to the church. That we might believe you. And that we might gain fruit that will last for all of eternity. Lord, we pray that the present conditions would not be a distraction to us to hear your voice. And we thank you that it is no limitation upon your power to continue to speak today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There is a biblical connection, there is a biblical connection between faithfulness and blessing in the Christian life. Let me say that to you again. There is a biblical connection between faithfulness, our faithfulness, and God's blessing. Or to say it another way, if we are faithful, God will bless us. Or in the reverse, if we are unfaithful, he will not bless us. Now, obviously, all those statements need qualification. All those statements need unpacking, and we need to understand what's happening in those statements, but it just is a biblical reality. If you don't believe me, let's look at a few different passages. Have a look at 1 Samuel chapter 2. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 30 God is addressing Eli for his faithlessness, and he says these words. Therefore the Lord, the God of Israel, declares, I promised that your house and the house of your father should go in and out before me forever. But now the Lord declares, far be it from me. For those who honor me, I will honor. Those who honor me, I will honor. And those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. And turn to Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 12. Sorry, chapter 18. Verse 9 to 10. If at any time... I declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will build and plant it. And if it does evil in my sight, not listening to my voice, 
then I will relent of the good that I had intended to do it. Or, from the words of Jesus in the Gospel of John, John chapter 12, verse 26, Jesus says, If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. So this is not just an Old Testament idea. It's an Old Testament and a New Testament idea that, that there is a connection between faithfulness and God's honor and blessing. And, and it's really important that we don't let the fear of the prosperity gospel on one hand and fear of legalism on the other hand deny us this precious doctrine. Deny us this motivation to faithfulness that we're given in the scriptures. So it's, it's often tempting to do what we call reactionary theology. Reactionary theology. It's when you see a problem and react by running the complete opposite way. You know, so you hear prosperity gospel preachers saying, if you give 20% of your income, God's going to give you a new Mercedes Benz. And you go, well, that's clearly not biblical. That's not how it works. And so you react by saying, it doesn't matter how we live. God blesses his people. We must not do that. We must find the biblical pathway. And, and so the doctrine is that the, the pathway to God's blessing is found in honoring the Lord. The pathway to God's blessing is found in honoring the Lord. And so to see that this morning, we need to consider firstly the Lord's rebuke of the people of Israel. Secondly, we need to consider the Lord's call to the people of Israel. And then lastly, the Lord's blessing itself to the people of Israel. So we, we remember in Malachi chapter 1 that all of this flows out of those first five verses. You remember right at the beginning of this book, we saw that it was all founded upon that amazing declaration of the love of God, where he says, I have loved you. And the people said, how have you loved us? And God said, I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated My love for you is sure, we saw. And, and out of that declaration of the love of God, out of that declaration of the love of God, we saw all of these different chastisements, all of these different disciplinary actions by God because he loves his people. Like a father loves his children, he disciplines them. And so he comes to them and he corrects them. And here we pick up the the last of the disciplines. This evening's sermon we will see is not a discipline, but rather a special message for some. But here in Malachi 3, verse 6 to 15, we find the final chastisement. And so God rebukes his people as a loving father, as a loving father. He comes to them and he rebukes them for three things. Firstly, for turning aside from God's word. Have a look at verse 7 with me. From the days of your father, from the days of your fathers, you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. You see, God had come to the people of Israel at Sinai and he had said to them, Here is my word. Here are my statutes. Here are my commandments. Here is the word of God. Now do it. I have set you free. Remember the Ten Commandments? Hear, O Israel, because I have set you free from slavery. Worship no other gods. You see, the, the law, the statutes, the commands come to them. And God says, I have redeemed you. I have saved you. Now live like this so you will flourish so that you will receive my blessing and not my discipline, not my cursing, not my chastisement. And yet they failed to do it. 
He says, from the very get-go, from the very get-go, you turned aside from my statutes. And don't you see that so quickly in the book of Exodus? You get Mount Sinai, and what happens instantaneously? The golden calf. Moses doesn't even get down with the commandments. And they're already whoring themselves after other gods, we're told. Hear, O Israel, Aaron says, here are the gods who led you out of Egypt. And it didn't get any better. They received the promised land. And in Judges, they gave themselves over to worship other gods and to deny God's word. But then David came. What a blessed hope. And David set everything in order, but David himself gave himself to sin. And then there was Solomon, the wise king, who established things well. And yet he committed himself to the idols of his foreign wives. And what happens by the time you get to the divided kingdom? Rehoboam and Jeroboam. Jeroboam runs out into the wilderness. He takes the people back to Israel and he says to them, you know, it's not good for you to go up to Jerusalem to worship at the temple. So let me create altars and gods here for you to worship God with. It's, it's so practical. It makes so much sense. It's a long way to Jerusalem. If they go there, they might not come back again because the temple's amazing. Yet he turned aside from the statutes and over and over and over again. And the people of God are now living in a time when they don't even have a king. All they have is a governor because they have failed to follow God's laws. They had failed to follow God's rules. Obeying God is not optional. In the old or the new covenant. Remember First Peter, be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. And yet they failed to. But then God clarifies exactly what he's thinking, doesn't he? In verse 9, he says to them, sorry, verse 8 and 9. Will man rob God, yet you are robbing me? But you say, how have we robbed you in your tithes and contributions? You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. But the people of God, we had already seen back in chapter 2 that they were offering filthy offerings to God. But, but now, they're, they're not even bringing what they're meant to bring as a gift to God. They're meant to tithe 10% of everything they received. That was the rule for very good reasons. It was set up so that the temple could flourish, so that God's people, the Levites, would be able to serve. Without that tithe, the house of worship stops. The people of God, his servants, his priests, they go hungry. They can't live. And so he had set it up in this way. And he says, this is what I want you to do, but they're not bringing it because well, you know, it's hard times, but I can't afford that. I need all my money. I haven't got the money to give that, the Israelites would say. I can't give my 10%. But, but do you hear what God says? He doesn't say, you're not giving me enough money, does he? It's interesting. He doesn't say, you're not giving me enough money. He says, you're robbing me. Why? Because... Everything they have is God's. What they had, what they had forgotten was that 100% of their resources was God's. And he had said to them, out of his love, see, this is our confusion, out of his love, he had said to them, I have given you 100%. 100%. I only want you to give me 10% back. You can have the other 90% for free. Yeah, Satan twists that, doesn't he? Satan comes to God's people and says, what? God's making you give him 10% of your stuff? That's not fair. He clearly doesn't love you. He's taxing you. Everyone hates taxes. 
You see, they had lost sight of the love of God. But worst of all, worst of all, was what this led to. As they failed to honor God and their, their city and their personhood struggled and everything fell, fell down around them, they started to grumble and murmur and complain against God himself. So verse 13 to 15, we read these words. Your words have been hard against me. But you say, how have we spoken against you? You have said, it is vain to serve the Lord. What is the profit of our keeping his charge or of walking as in mourning before the Lord of hosts? And now we call the arrogant blessed. Evildoers not only prosper, but they put God to the test and they escape. You see, they believe the lie that God doesn't love them. And they said, it's clear. There's no point in me giving 10%. There's no point in me offering right sacrifices. There's no point in me honoring the Lord. Look around us. It clearly doesn't work. Because, as we saw last week, they had taken their eyes off eternity, hadn't they? And they looked here and now. They looked around them. They looked at their enemies who prospered. They looked at the rich people of the world who don't give 10% and continue getting richer. They said, these other nations don't give you anything and they're prospering. And here we are dwindling. You see, one thing leads to the other. They turn aside from God's law and the turning aside from God's law produces corruption and rebellion. So they stop tithing. And the stopping of tithing leads to grumbling because when things aren't going well, when they're not blessed, they don't look at themselves and say, what am I doing wrong? Where is the fault? The instantaneous response of a rebellious heart is to lay the blame at the feet of God, isn't it? Don't we do it so quickly? And are we... Are we that different than the people of Israel? Are we that different? How well has the church for the last 2,000 years followed God's word with rigor? Now, there's a reason we're here, and it's because the church didn't. 1970. Lloyd Gehring put on heresy trial because he didn't believe God existed and they didn't kick him out. What is that? It's an utter turning aside from God's word. And we can all do this in the littlest of ways, can't we? You know, maybe we're not denying the existence of God. I trust not anyway. But... What happens when we read the texts about being a cheerful giver? And have to pain, painfully rub a few coins together to throw in the coffer. What happens when we're called not to quarrel over opinions? And we think to ourselves, yeah, but it's just, it's just such an important issue. We're told not to divide on matters of opinion. We think to ourselves, yeah, but this is so important. You see, Israel didn't get to where they're at by rejecting the whole word of God in one go. That's never how churches do it either. Liberal churches don't go from faithful churches to liberal churches instantaneously. It happens with one tiny little decision at a time and it comes from an attitude and heart that says my feelings my opinions my sentiments and the people around me are more important than God's word and that's a message that's everywhere right now that's a message that's everywhere right now but then 
Are, are we any different when it comes to tithing? Now, tithing was an Old Testament concept, but don't think tithing goes away in the New Testament. It doesn't get abolished. Remember, Jesus said nothing gets abolished. Every dot and tittle of the law is fulfilled. Tithing becomes free will offering. You see, the 10% of the tithing in the Old Testament becomes more glorious. Why? Because we've experienced more grace. And so what was only 10% now becomes, I've experienced so much grace. I've seen so much of the revealed will of God. I have seen Christ in a way that none of the Old Testament did. How much can I give? And it becomes not just money. It becomes not just some sheep. It becomes everything. See, You see, everything we have is His. We give everything for Him. And because we have received much, Jesus says we love much. Our wallets should be way more open than the Israelites who had to tithe on mint and dill and cumin. Can you imagine that? Your little herb plant at home, cutting 10% off and bringing it to the temple. That's what they did. I would trust that some of them did it out of love for their Lord. And we too, we too should be, should be proactively giving. You know, I've never preached on giving before in a church. It's something that is just abused in so many different churches. And maybe you've come from churches which abused it and drove it as a way to build back better, as a way to build better kingdoms and buy the pastor nice vehicles. That's not what it's about. It's about saying, Lord, all my silver all my gold, not one might will I withhold. Take it all for your glory. Take all of it, every cent. Do with it as you please for the sake of your glory. Do we do that with a cheerful heart? We all, we all know what it's like, don't we? You see, because we're not talking about legalism here. We're talking about a gospel-fueled, gospel-centered heart that overflows with joy in Christ that brings us to go, you know what? Just take it all. Take it all. You know, you think, think about the Hebrews who, who with joy, it tells us, with joy watched the plundering of their homes. Can you do that? Imagine that. People break into your home and plunder it because you're a Christian. It says, with joy, they sat and watched. Why? Because it's all going to rot in the ground, but Christ isn't. There's something far more glorious. And we can do this. We're faithless to his word in the smallest of ways and sometimes in big ways. We fail to give him our all and we murmur and complain against him. And so the question has to be, do we want God's blessing? We're going to have to qualify what God's blessing is, but do we want to be blessed by God? Well, then we need to be faithful to him. And so God in his infinite mercy and in his grace and his love, you know, a loving father, he doesn't just cast them out, does he? But like a father, he comes and disciplines them. He comes to them and he calls them home. He calls them back like the father waiting for the prodigal son, but he's loudly calling out instead, return, return. Have a look with me at verse 7, the second half. Return to me. Return to me and I will return to you. Return to me. What's the response if we've been faithless? Maybe you're sitting here and, and you hear me talking about the giving of money and, and you, know, you feel that pinch of guilt inside of your heart. Or, or maybe you've just failed to follow God's word. Maybe fear has welled up and controlled the way you understand and apply God's word in your life. Or whatever it is, if, when you feel guilt welling up, what is the response the response is repentance. To turn to the God who comes to us and says, return to me. 
return to me. Return to me. What is repentance? Well, quite literally, it's a turning from one thing to the other. It's to turn from this direction and that direction and to now go that way. And it's interesting, isn't it? Because God says you've turned aside from the law. So you think you've turned aside from the law and then he says, return. So come back to it. Come back to me. Come back to the way, the pathway of blessing. It involves both a change of heart, intention, love, but it also has an action to it. You see, God doesn't just say to them, start thinking and believing differently, does he? He says to them, return. And they say, how shall we return? And he says, start tithing. They're really practical, isn't it? It's like they've been robbing God. He says, we're really simple. Start doing it. You know, we feel, so we feel guilt. And we're convicted by God's word through his Holy Spirit. We think to ourselves, oh, well, what shall I do? I've been gossiping. God says, repent. Stop gossiping. Or whatever it is. Why? Because he has set us free from sin. He has set us free for himself. You see, we, we have not been set free to live for ourselves. I remember that, that wonderful word and the first question and answer of the Heidelberg Catechism? Whose are we? Jesus's. I belong both body and soul to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. I don't belong to me. My money doesn't belong to me. My energy doesn't belong to me. My time doesn't belong to me. My work doesn't belong to me. My car doesn't belong to me. My children don't belong to me. Nothing belongs to me. I belong to him and everything with it. And we see this loud and clear in the New Testament. In, in 1 Peter it's one of, my, one of my favorite passages, 1 Peter. First Peter, chapter 13. So this is, this is Peter exhorting the people to faithfulness in response to the gospel. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Why? Verse 18. You were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. You've been bought, ransomed, purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. Therefore, live for him. Live for him. And it is this gracious merciful call of God that came to Israel and comes to you and I. Look, none of us are perfect. I'm less perfect than probably all of you. Yet, he comes to each one of us as the word of God shines a spotlight on our life and he says to us, come back. Put off the former ignorance of the world. And live for me. Give me your all. Give me your all. Because I've bought it all. But then notice the blessing that comes with it. You see, he's, he's not a tyrant who comes to pillage and steal. He's not a tyrant who comes to harm you. He's a father who comes to love you. And so God comes with a blessing. 
having rebuked them and invited them, called them to faithfulness, he offers a promise of a blessing. And this is, this is stunning, and we need to let the weight of this hit us. Have a look at verse 10. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test. I wonder if that phrase, put me to the test, rings any alarm bells. What does Jesus say to the devil in the wilderness? Do not put the Lord your God to the test. And God himself says at the very end of this that one of the evil things they're doing is, is saying that evildoers not only prosper, but they put God to the test. So the, so the people are saying, God's, these people are putting God to the test. It's evil. And God says to them, I want you to put me to the test. Put me to the test. Now he's not saying test as if I'm real. He's saying Try out my promises. Think about my promises. Try them out like you'd try out gold in the fire. Test it out. Come, come, test drive my promises and see what happens. Give 10% and just watch. Just watch. And look at the blessing. Put me to the test, he says. See if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil and your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. So the first blessing he offers is a physical outpouring, replacing anything and more abundantly should they give to him, should they honor him, should they faithfully tithe. Before we consider that, just there's two other blessings to quickly note. Verse 7, where he says, return to me, he says, I will return to you. So honor me and you will receive me. I will be the blessing. You see, when the people were faithless, God left the camp. Or he was a consuming fire. You remember in the wilderness where God says to them, Moses, carry on. Take the people and go. I'm sending an angel. I'm not going to go with you anymore. Moses was mortified, wasn't he? He falls down. God, no, I'm not going anywhere. I'm not going anywhere unless you are with us. Because God himself was the sign of the blessing. And then thirdly, he blesses in verse 12 by saying, All nations will call you blessed, for you will be a land of delight. In other words, their joy and satisfaction will be rooted in God himself and everybody who walks past Israel will say, look, look at what God has done for them. Oh, that I might have some of that blessing. What a glorious promise for the people of Israel that they might have God himself, that they might have the work of their hands blessed, that they might delight in him and be a testimony to the entire world of the goodness of the Lord. But then we have to ask the question, how do we qualify that? Because we know, in case you're not aware, we're not the people, physical people of Israel. God has not promised us that he is going to give us a Mercedes Benz if we give a whole bunch of money to the church. He has not promised us that our business will flourish and succeed if we're faithful. Otherwise, there is a whole lot of Christian martyrs who have been cursed by God. And yet the entire Christian church throughout history has recognized that martyrdom is the chief privilege of any Christian believer that there is no higher calling or privilege in the kingdom of God than to die for your faith. They consider it the, the imminent, the preeminent blessing of God, a crown of glory to perish in the flames with the name of Christ upon your lips. So what is this blessing then? Well, in the Old Testament, the blessings were seen primarily in physical things. Israel was promised a blessing of a land, 
a blessing of a people, a blessing of a nation, and a blessing of being a blessing to everyone else. But all of that, the purpose of all of that was a spiritual reality. The purpose of all of that was to point to Jesus Christ, who would establish a true land and a true people and a true blessing and a true nation, one people under Jesus Christ himself. And so when he comes to us, we receive the same blessing, but it's infinitely more glorious. Because he comes to us and he doesn't say, I'm not giving you 70 years of blessing on this earth. I'm giving you eternal blessings in Christ Jesus. Who gives a rip about a new car when you get glory in heaven? Says to, he says to us, you know, I'm so loving. I'm so kind. I'm so gracious. Why would I give you a benefit in work? When through the difficulty of your work, through the difficulty of your family life, through the abuse you have suffered, I can bring around an eternal weight of glory that far surpasses anything this world can do to you. That's what he's offering us. He's saying, be faithful, be faithful, my people, and I will bless you with eternal spiritual riches. It's the fulfillment of all of the blessings of the people of Israel. And, and if you're wondering whether this is true, turn with me to 2 Corinthians. You can turn there even if you think I'm right. But 2 Corinthians. <laughs> 2 Corinthians chapter 9, a passage on giving. 9, just verse 6 to begin. The point is this. The point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Okay, so the principle, Paul says, is this. If you give, you're going to receive. If you're honor, if you're faithful, you're going to be blessed abundantly. Now, that is a favorite verse of the prosperity gospel preachers. And they'll say, therefore, give lots of money to the church. And then he's going to give you lots of money. But notice, now as we go through this passage, look out for what Paul is urging us to do and what we are going to receive because of it if we do it. From verse 7, each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So that's what you must do. Give with a cheerful heart, not under reluctancy or compulsion. Verse 8, and God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in money. No, you may abound in every good work. So you'll be faithful in this work and he's going to make his grace abound so that you're faithful in more works. Because you're storing up riches in heaven, Jesus says. Then verse 9, as it is written, he has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. Interesting, isn't it? You be faithful and he's going to make your seed of righteousness increase. In other words, You're going to become more like Jesus. Then verse 11, you will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. So you'll be generous with everyone, and he's going to make you even more generous, and you're going to give thanks while doing it. It sounds a bit weird, doesn't it? I'm going to give, I've got $100 left in my account. I'm going to give 20 away. And having given 20 away, the Spirit of God is going to work in my heart to give away the other 40. And I'm going to look at the 20 when I needed 100, and I'm going to praise God and give thanks to Him for His faithfulness. And I have seen this firsthand when I was in Rotorua. And the pastor who trained me Bless his soul. He came to me 
to visit us. And, and he always brings stuff with him when he visits. And so he walks in with a whole bunch of groceries that he's just bought, you know, watermelons and all sorts of yummy treats and puts them down. He gives them to the kids and we spend a bunch of time and he goes off to visit someone else. And, and then I went out and played golf with him a little bit later on. And I, and I just had this, I had this urge in me to give something back just out of thankfulness to what he had done. So I gave him something back and he started crying. I said, why are you crying? He said, oh, I'm just, sorry. He said, I'm just so overwhelmed at the goodness of God because I spent my last penny dropping off the last package to someone. And we weren't sure what we were going to do going forward. And so here he is dropping food off, giving thanks, rejoicing in the goodness of God. He has no idea what's coming next week. But he knew his God would care for him and love him. Verse 12, For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overwhelming in many thanksgivings to God. By their approval of this service, they will glorify God because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contribution for them and for all others. While they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God upon you, thanks be to God for this inexpressible gift. Honestly, brothers and sisters, who cares about getting blessed in this life? When you can be a part of thanksgiving and glory and joy and prayers and infinite mercy in heaven. Just honestly, let me encourage you, test the Lord, just give it all away. Give up everything. Sacrifice it all for the sake of Christ. Be faithful to the very end, to the point of death itself. Let us, let us honor Christ here, no matter what it's going to cost us, no matter what the neighbors think about us, no matter what the world thinks, who cares? Let's honor Christ, be faithful to his word above everything else, trusting that it will lead to glory and thanksgiving and honor and praise. And that the fiery trial before us will store up for us a righteousness in heaven that can never be surpassed. You know, there's, there's two pastors in, in Finland experiencing that right now. In 2004, they wrote a document that said, men are men, women are women, and they marry one another. 2004, hate speech laws got passed and they've now been arrested and being trialed because they hold faithfully to God's word. Our Pakistani brethren are dying. Our African brethren are dying. And who knows if it's coming here, but whether it comes or not, let us live faithfully to the very end. Though every other church might forsake him, let us stand firm upon the word of God to the very end. He says, test me. And yet, you know, the wonderful thing is, he never lets his people go without in this life either. And so in closing, turn with me to, to Mark. Let me show you one of the most wonderful principles of all of this. All, all of our riches, Mark 10, all of our riches are in heaven. We store up there. We forsake family, friends, workplaces, everything. We give up everything to follow Christ. And then in Mark 10, verse 28, we find these incredible words. Peter began to say to him, See, we have left everything and followed you. We've given up everything to follow you, Jesus. What about us? Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left his house or brothers or sisters, or mother, or father, or children, 
or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time. In this time. Houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions. And in the age to come, eternal life. And I can testify that it's true. One of my biggest fears when I became a Christian was that I'd have no friends. Because all my friends were non-Christians. All of my friends were boozers. And my wife, bless her soul, didn't want them in our house. Praise the Lord for a faithful wife. And she wouldn't let me go and hang out with them by myself. Praise the Lord for a faithful wife. And so I was like, I'm going to have no friends. I'm going to have no one to hang out with. What am I going to do? I've got hundreds of friends. Hundreds of family. Two brothers that don't know the Lord right now, but look at all the brothers and sisters around me. Isn't that true for you too? Has there been anything in your life that you have had to give up for Jesus that he has not given you way more? I don't think you'll find anything. It may hurt at first. But Jesus says, 100-fold in this life with persecutions and then eternal life. Brothers and sisters, try it out. That's what God says. Test me. Live faithfully. Devote yourself to his word. Give, give, and give wherever and whenever. And see the storehouses of heaven open up in Christ Jesus himself. Amen? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that you are an abundant God. 100-fold, Lord. That's what your son promised. That's what your son said. 100-fold with persecution. Lord, we acknowledge that we are weak that we are quick to forsake your word, especially when it's hard. And so we pray, would you help us? Help us to be faithful no matter the cost. Help us to simply take your word and so live by it that we would see nothing but your spiritual blessing. Lord, I thank you for the reward of following you faithfully, that you don't abandon us in this world even in persecution. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.